Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the absolute final home stretch of Journalism Under Fire. This is live stream number 28 out of an amazing 30, which means, of course, we have, in addition to tonight, two more to go. You've heard all about it, but I'll tell you again, tomorrow night we have uh, our closing ceremony. It starts at 5 p.m. Mountain Time, and we have a whole suite of guests for you. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Joel Simon from CPJ in conversation with Dana Priest. Dana will then swivel her chair and interview Bob Woodward, uh, and then we'll continue the interviewing with uh, Peter Baker, Chief White House Correspondent for the New York Times, uh, and his wife Susan Glasser, who's a staff writer for the New Yorker. It's going to be a fantastic night. We have some music as well, um, and I really hope you can join us. And then on Friday at 10 a.m., we have our very final stream, which will uh, have myself and Dana Priest in conversation, reflecting on the conference, taking your questions taking your reflections and your learnings so that we can continue to make this experience an amazing one and of course start looking ahead to journalism under fire number four in 2021 which i don't really want to think about yet but we'll certainly do and and we want your feedback on that too and we want your ideas on that too um, we will be creating a really big learning document that 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 really captures everything that's happened in this conference if you have something that you wanna share, some insight that you gleaned, some speaker, some panel that really struck you, we wanna hear from you. Drop us a line to evaluation at sfcir.org uh, and we'll include you and your comments uh, in, in this final document. Um, two other quick things. Uh, this of course is the holiday season. I hope you are spending it safely uh, and with your loved ones. Uh, it's the spirit of giving as well. And uh, of course, we always love uh, donations here uh, at CIR, but even better would be the gift of membership because we love having more and more people as part of our community. So you all have people in your life you know would love to participate in, um, in our live streams, in our in-person events when they resume. And of course, we have our big holiday party on December the 8th. Of course, this will be uh, a virtual holiday party, but uh, we'd love to have you and your brand new member friends come and join us for that. You'll need to RSVP for that soon, just because we have some special things lined up that we want to make sure we're all completely sorted for. So let me now turn and introduce tonight's uh, moderator, Courtney Ratch. And Courtney, hello and welcome. Hello. Thanks so much. So glad to be here. <laughs> So I have a really quick little story about Courtney. I met Courtney in February of 2018 when the first journalism under fire was really in its absolute you know, idea stage. And I visited Courtney at her office uh, in uh, Washington DC um, and, and presented this, this crazy idea that we would bring a bunch of amazing journalists and speakers to Santa Fe. And, uh, and I asked Courtney whether CPJ might be interested in, uh, in participating in that. And they very much were. And really ever since CPJ has been an instrumental partner for us in terms of identifying speakers, in terms of identifying themes and content that we should look at and really drawing upon a lot of their amazing work uh, around the world. So let me just quickly introduce you, Courtney. So Courtney is uh, the chief spokesperson on global press freedom issues for the Committee to Protect Journalists, or CPJ as we call it, and oversees its engagement with the United Nations, the Internet Governance Forum, and other multilateral institutions. And of course, she was a keynote speaker at Journalism Under Fire 2018. So welcome, Courtney. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I know we're still waiting for Patricia, who's having computer issues, but she is signing on um, as we speak. Excellent. So what, before we get to Patricia, let me ask you, you came to Santa Fe in uh, December 2018. What jumps out at you from your time here? What uh, memory or experience was really important or valuable for you at that time? I just thought the the way that you brought together so many different people, uh, including students and people from the community. I understand there's a you know retirement community there, people who have kind of worked in government and civil society overseas, and the level of engagement and interest on this issue I think was really extraordinary. I think the the one that stood out the most for me, I mean, definitely talking with Jason Rosion about his experience um, being imprisoned in Iran stood out. But the conversation I remember, what one of the most interesting conversations I thought was between Dana Priest um, from the Washington Post, who covers national security, and um, the former, you know, spy uh, whose name Valerie is Valerie Plain. 
Valerie Plame, thank you. Um, Valerie, and talking about the similarities between journalism and spycraft, I thought that was just really fascinating and have enjoyed working with you over the years to think about interesting programming, bring in new voices, as well as some of the um, established big names in the field. So really excited to be partnering with you on this again and apologize for my scratchy voice since I'm just getting over a cold. Well, welcome. Oh, we saw Patricia for a second. Um, hi, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can. I'm so sorry. I had the uh, computer issues. <laughs> Your timing so is absolutely perfect. So welcome. <laughs> We're thrilled to see you. And so, Courtney, why don't I turn everything over to you? And for the folks out there, please type your questions into the Q&A box and we will get to them uh, as the program unfolds. Great. Well, thanks so much. I'm glad you can uh, join us, Patricia. So without further ado, um, we are going to talk about disinformation, trolling, and some of the press freedom challenges in Brazil with one of Brazil's and frankly the world's leading journalists covering Brazilian politics, working for the Fala de São Brasil, sorry, Fala de São Paulo, which I'm sure I'm butchering since I don't speak Portuguese. Um, but it is Brazil's leading newspaper. She also just recently authored a book. Um, which I've been making my way through in Portuguese, which I don't speak, but uh, nonetheless, I'm able to read a bit. And it really is a fascinating um, description of what you call the hate machine. So we're going to discuss a bit about what that means, um, your experience as a journalist, and your thoughts on the brighter press freedom dynamics in the world as we get into this conversation. And I do want to encourage folks to put in your questions in the Q&A and I will try to weave those in throughout as well as leave time at the end to um, address specific questions. And um, Patricia, you have a long career in journalism. You've worked as a foreign correspondent. You covered the refugee crisis on multiple continents. You've covered the Ebola crisis, the coronavirus crisis, um, and you have been lauded with a number of awards in recognition of your extraordinary achievements. So if you will indulge me, I thought we could show a very brief uh, video that we put together that kind of encapsulates a little bit about your story so that maybe the people on this call um, or this, this virtual event who don't know too much about the Brazilian press freedom scene or your own experience uh, could, could hear a little bit about that. Does that sound good? Sure. Great. Sounds wonderful. Right. Thank you. Sandy, do you want to go ahead and get that up? E eu cheguei a essa investigação que era que você tinha várias agências de marketing que estavam trabalhando fazendo disparos de mensagens em massa por WhatsApp disparando tanto notícias falsas como propaganda. Era uma matéria mostrando que vários empresários estavam pagando por esses disparos e se preparavam para fazer uma mega ofensiva aí de disparos contra o, o candidato Fernando Haddad, que estava correndo contra o Jair Bolsonaro. One of the main ways to describe Patricia as a journalist, I think, is fearless. She has done just about everything over the course of her career. More recently, she's also been engaged in the past presidential elections, which has not gained her many friends. Milhares de memes com a minha cara. Essa foto falsa. Não sou eu. Aí, fake news. Vou mostrar, inclusive, aqui o Bolsonaro compartilhou. No momento em que ele tweetou isso aqui, falando meu nome, não sei o quê, nossa, aí que começaram as ameaças. Isso funciona, de uma certa maneira, como uma censura, porque cada vez que a gente vai escrever uma matéria, você pensa duas vezes, porque você vai passar por isso, sua família vai passar por isso. E pela primeira vez que eu estava fazendo uma matéria eleitoral, eu tinha que andar com um guarda-costas, né? Eu nunca tinha tido um guarda-costas na vida, em nenhuma matéria, em nenhum lugares que estão em guerra. Brazil, in general, has, for the last decade, been a very violent country for journalists. So it's a really difficult time to be a journalist covering politics in Brazil right now. O CPJ é essencial na medida em que chama atenção para abusos que estão sendo cometidos contra jornalistas. 
estava no, no pico das ameaças no ano passado, o CPJ se posicionou e ao dar esse prêmio hoje, é uma sinalização de que esse tipo de comportamento em relação a jornalistas, principalmente jornalistas mulheres, não pode ser um novo normal. A big part of our work in Brazil is making sure that we are helping to amplify what Brazilian journalists are saying. E a gente tem que entender que é muito importante o que a gente está fazendo e não existe. Bom, então eu vou escrever. Great. So that gives you, maybe, you viewers, um, attendees, a little bit of a sense of what Patricia has gone through. And we made this film over a year ago um, before we awarded Patricia the International Press Freedom Award. And since then, I think you've gone on to get several other prestigious awards. And you were telling me that actually things have worsened. Not only um, have, have you been the victim of online harassment and, you know, threats over the um, over the election period, but now again, you said it's gotten even worse. What is going on in Brazil? What's happening with uh, the situation there? Give us a give us an update. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you, Courtney, and and thank you for having me uh, at this event. It's really an honor. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think right now in Brazil, um, we have an orchestrated um, effort to intimidate journalists. Uh, and this is done mainly uh, um, with online threats, but not only. I mean, to have an idea, uh, the main media outlets, they had to stop sending reporters uh, to cover the presidential press briefings because they were being you know, harassed and, and threatened uh, by uh, President Bolsonaro's supporters. So it got to a point that there was no security, so they stopped sending people altogether. Um, it's, it's especially bad with women journalists here in Brazil, and I understand India is also like this. Uh, I mean, all I'm not the only one. There's several uh, women journalists uh, who suffer frequently this kind of... Um, uh, I mean, it's an orchestrated intimidation effort. So they're always saying that either, you know, you offer sex or you're ugly or you're old, you're your husband something. And then this gets massive and overwhelming. I mean, in, in my case, they had like thousands of memes with uh, porn images and, and porn videos that they uh, make uh, montages with my face and um, so this is a strategy because it, it sort of works as a, a kind of censorship. I mean, every time we're about to publish something or a story that is investigative and that we understand that the government's not going to like it, we are already expecting uh, some sort of attack. And that I don't I don't think we're self-censoring, but I, I do think we pause before we publish something or uh, on TV because I mean, you start to think, what's going to happen to my family? How are they going to react? You know, it's it's not only, we're not alone in this, right? So, and I think, I mean, ever since uh, President Bolsonaro's election in 2018, this has become um, the new normal, unfortunately. Uh, and also because we have been covering COVID-19 um, and the government uh, is one of the most uh, uh, COVID-19 deniers uh, around the world. Uh, so this is also something that annoys uh, the government because we've been you know, covering uh, ICUs in public hospitals and uh, when there's lack of equipment and you know, what's the real situation that the government is trying to um, either omit or just portray in a better light. So this is always uh, difficult. And I think that's something that we are certainly seeing the Committee to Protect Journalists around the world is this retaliation against independent reporting on the coronavirus, on the status of kind of the government response on, you know, basic numbers of infections. But you know, I want to go to something you said about um, kind of Bolsonaro's role in all of this and you know, what online harassment does. It was interesting because you'll remember last year, we, it was a whole different year. Um, we met with Vice President Pence uh, in the White House. And I remember you telling him about the online abuse that you've suffered. And he seemed to be surprised to hear that it was coming from Bolsonaro. Um, now, there are a lot of similarities, it seems, between 
uh, President Trump, Bolsonaro, you mentioned India with President Modi. We've also seen similarly in the Philippines where another, you know, icon journalist, a, a woman journalist, Maria Ressa, has been under threat there by President Duterte. So we see this common playbook. And as I was, you know, thinking about our conversation, preparing for this, it, it, it struck me that it seems like there has been an evolution. And I, I want you to tell me if this seems right for Brazil and, and if we can talk a little bit more about it, but it seems like it's start, the whole fake news, you know, disinformation operation started with using fake news as a way to delegitimize journalists to pillory independent journalism. And then it evolved to amplify Bolsonaro's message. You, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the story that you, you know, revealed in 2018. And now it has evolved into actual fake news that has potential serious health, you know, repercussions. So talk to us a little bit about the evolution in, in Brazil and what it means, not only for journalists, but for the public and, and you know, public health. Um, definitely. I think it's it's definitely the same playbook. Uh, and in the case of Bolsonaro in Brazil, he actually emulates uh, President Donald Trump in everything. I mean, uh, to the extent that when President Trump canceled subscriptions for the New York Times, a week later, President Bolsonaro canceled subscriptions for one of the main uh, newspapers in Brazil, Folha. Uh, so it's it gets it's almost ridiculous the way uh, he emulates. And I do agree. I mean, in in the beginning, it was just sort of say you know, uh, critical reporting is fake news. Uh, this is not. This is partisan. Uh, and then uh, it, it got. I mean. Um, it's part of, it's an integral part of this strategy. If you want to maintain your supporters in sort of an in informational bubble, you know, for instance, I'm, I'm gonna give you an example. In Brazil, uh, the government and, and social media accounts of the government, they only um, publish uh, positive news about COVID-19. So they only talk about people who have recovered. They don't tell the public how many people have died, right? And they even try to, uh, they have to um, delegitimize uh, specific journalists, specific media outlets, and at the same time, try to intimidate. So these are things that go together, you know, on the, the same time you just spread this information. I mean, Brazil is the only country in the world that is still uh, has a high circulation of uh, fake news or disinformation about hydroxychloroquine curing COVID-19. Why? Because the president himself and uh, you know politicians and ministers are saying this. Um, so, so well, I, I want to. So you, oh, oh, you finish your thought, and let me follow up on that. No, I was just going to say, and that depends on you uh, just eliminating the filter of professional journalism or the, you know, so you, you, delete, you, you get, uh, you eliminate the credibility of uh, media outlets saying, you know, these people are communists, the communists is the word they use here, uh, so that you can maintain people just, you know, uh, disinformed. So, you know, that's a, I think that's a really critical point. You're pointing out, you know, a lot of the um, disinformation is originating from the politicians themselves, from political leaders. Um, you have the disintermediation of the media. So now they, you know, they can go right to the public through social media platforms. Brazil is, uh, has a new fake news law. Well, sorry, social media law. Um, that is ostensibly aimed at preventing and, and you know, lessening the circulation of, of so-called fake news and disinformation. Um, I know there's been a lot of criticism. I, I, I know that you're trying to think about a middle road, but tell us about what, what is in, about this law and is that really going to have an impact if the political leaders themselves are the ones that are perpetuating misinformation or disinformation? Um, yes, that's an excellent question. Uh, we do have a, a bill that is being discussed in, in Congress. Now it, it's uh, in the House here in Brazil, uh, the fake news legislation. But at this point in Brazil, we, we have a very binary discussion because on the one hand, you have the internet platforms and uh, right-wing politicians and uh, 
few of the civil society organizations that say that any kind of regulation of uh, speech on the internet would be a censorship. So therefore, there's nothing to do. And on the other hand, you have some legislators saying, uh, basically trying to criminalize speech. You know, they're going to criminalize regular people who are accidentally sharing uh, this information or journalists or activists. So it's always uh, this very binary thing instead of thinking, you know, uh, of, of course we have to rethink the immunity to internet uh, platforms, right? I mean, it's not, they don't have enough incentives to curb this information. Uh, I mean, they have been a little bit more proactive, both in the US and in Brazil, they've been labeling um, presidential tweets or, or posts. But I mean, to what extent can you moderate the president of a country? I mean, are you going to be constantly labeling all tweets? And once you have a president or a minister that is himself or herself spreading uh, this information, uh, this becomes so much more uh, potent. You know, I mean, it, it's very hard to to counter this kind of uh, uh, disinformation campaign. So uh, I do think it's a very difficult situation. I mean, um, you know, we know we need regulation, but we can't risk getting into censorship like some countries like um, Singapore or Vietnam. And at the same time, how do you moderate or regulate the president? I think we're grappling with many of those same questions here and around the world. Um, and as you said, you know, some of the tech platforms did decide, I believe it was Facebook removed about 100 pages or suspended about 100 accounts and pages that were somehow related to Bolsonaro. Um, your reporting in 2018, which you know led to so much of this harassment and attacks against you, was about revealing the political manipulation and purchasing of you know, social media amplification by Bolsonaro's campaign and, and targeting of the other campaign with fake news. Can you tell us you know, what do you find and have the platforms addressed the issue that your reporting uncovered or do they need to do more? Um, they definitely need to do more but it's a whole new situation. I mean, in 2018, and I think it might be the same in, in, in the US, they are much more proactive. In 2018, we first uh, revealed that they were using uh, WhatsApp bulk messaging in WhatsApp groups. I mean, Brazil is the second largest uh, market for WhatsApp. We have 130 million users in a population of 209 million. So pretty much everybody uses WhatsApp and gets all kinds of information, mainly political information from WhatsApp. So they were flooding WhatsApp groups with the most bizarre, uh, you know, telling that uh, the opposition politicians were, uh, uh, pedophiles and, you know, uh, that they would distribute in schools, public schools, um, penis-shaped bottles for the babies. I mean, it's just bizarre. And, and this was really overwhelming. So when we first uh, uh, started to talk about this, how businessmen were financing these operations, because you have software that does this mass messaging, you know, that costs money. Uh, and all the other bots as well. I mean, the reaction from the government and from the internet platforms is like, oh, this is ridiculous. It doesn't exist. Everything is just organic, blah, blah, blah. Well, a year after that, WhatsApp for the first time admitted to the use of the platform in a massive way to try to uh, influence the Brazilian election. And the electoral court changed the legislation and, and you know, passed. Uh, now it's uh, forbidden to use this kind of uh, tool. Right. Uh, I mean, of course, it evolves. Right. I mean, this information technology, once you have regulation for something, they just develop something new. But I do think that, you know, um, both in terms of uh, labeling and, and um, moderating uh, presidents or, or people who have a, a big loudspeaker, you know, in, in the Internet platforms and regulating uh, tools, technological tools that um, allow you to spread this information in a much faster way. Um, it's much better than it used to be, than it was in 2018, but still, I mean, it's it's just overwhelming. I mean, we, we see the amount of uh, disinformation that's still going on on Facebook, on Twitter, WhatsApp, it's, it's hard. 
Yeah, and of course, it's not uh, unique to Brazil. We saw Facebook implicated um, in the genocide in Myanmar. We've seen, you know, Facebook put limitations on WhatsApp messaging after India. Uh, you know, the the same sort of dynamics occurred in India after those elections. So, you know, none of this seems to be new. But I don't want a discussion about press freedom and journalists to only focus on the tech platforms, because this is also an extraordinary moment for journalism and for journalists like yourself. And I want to just turn the tables a little bit and talk about your coverage of health emergencies. You covered Ebola. You are covering COVID, um, whether or not you want to, right? Every journalist is a COVID journalist, we, we have to say these days. What what are the similarities? What are the differences? You know, we're not only in terms of the technological environment in which you're reporting on, but you know, what did you learn out of your reporting on Ebola and Sierra Leone? Anything that was relevant for the pandemic? Anything that sticks out as you know really interesting as a reporter covering two different pandemics? Well, I think one thing that uh, it's it's very similar is. Uh, um, uh, conspiracy theories. This is like, uh, I remember back in, in 2014 during the Ebola uh, outbreak in, in Sierra Leone, which is where I went to, to cover it. It was, you know, every front page of the newspapers that there was a lab that created that was linked to whatever Microsoft or George Soros. And now this time we again have all these conspiracy theories. Um, and the one thing I remember is when I was covering uh, in, in Sierra Leone, I was thinking, okay, so this is a very poor country. Public hospitals don't have enough equipment. You know, people are getting infected because they don't have uh, the personal equipment, personal protection equi equipment. Um, and because it's a country that has been through, you know, civil war. And then I went back to Brazil and uh, two years later we had the Zika crisis, right? Uh, and I went to the countryside in the northeast of Brazil, and I just saw, you know, it was exactly the same thing. We didn't have a pediatri pediatrician to take care of the babies who were born with microcephaly because of the Zika. And now we see with COVID-19, the same thing. You know, we, we think that we're prepared, that we're getting better, the infrastructure, the public hospitals, and then we just get to see how, uh, I mean, we lack everything. For instance, now uh, we, there was, uh, that there's good news about the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, right? And Brazil is not gonna buy it because we don't have uh, the labs uh, necessary to maintain the vaccine temperature, the low temperature. So, I mean, this is so, every time it, it's a humbling experience to cover health crisis because you get to see uh, how poorly prepared and how, you know, people who need the public hospital and the public uh, health system are just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. And so it, this is really interesting to say that, um, you know, you've seen the conspiracy theories as a common strain throughout. Um, that's, I think that's something that's been less reported on, you know, kind of less commonly known about uh, Ebola and, and Zika as well. How can journalists combat this? What is the media's role in trying to combat the conspiracy theories while also not amplifying them? That's the huge question we're trying to, um, well, I think two things. Uh, one of the things, both with uh, conspiracy theories and with unproven medical treatments, in Brazil, both are very serious. Like we had one of the fake news uh, that was circulating most widely was that uh, some mayors were burying people, uh, actually were burying coffins with stones inside them in, instead of people because, you know, COVID was not really serious and they wanted money from the federal government. So they were just burying those coffins and there were like thousands of videos showing this and people believed them. And at the same time, you had the president and several other people saying that either everybody should be taking uh, hydroxychloroquine because that would cure, so you don't need social distancing or that you should be taking um, this medication that it's actually for worms uh, and it, it's not effective at all. So then people started running to the pharmacies and, and buying those things. So how do we deal with this? 
Well, first, I think one of the things that we're learning, we're trying to learn, is we have to contextualize right away. Because when you write, okay, so like President Bolsonaro says that hydroxychloroquine saved his life. However, I mean, if you don't say it right away uh, with no concrete evidence, with no scientific evidence, or it's a lie, calling a lie a lie, which we as journalists, we're not very comfortable doing this, but we have to, because otherwise, I mean, people are just going to read the title or, you know, the first uh, sentence on TV. Uh, and also, I mean, uh, just being very um, careful when we are reporting about conspiracy theories, because I'm thinking, does that help debunk them or just amplifies them or just gives them like a, a veneer of legitimacy, you know? when it goes to, to mainstream media or to professional media. So I think uh, unless it gets really like a dimension that you need to be out there, and, and we know it's very frustrating that some people even confronted with you know facts and evidence that something is not true, they'll go on believing on it. So um, I think we're still learning, we're doing, but I think contextualizing is, is really important. I mean, it seems to me that we are in a moment where journalism has to fundamentally grapple with some of the premises of how mainstream, you know, traditional journalism is done. The showing both sides of an issue, um, the economic models that have been pulled out from under us. I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned in Brazil, I mean, not only do we have the ongoing economic crisis caused by you know, the reconfiguration of the economic model with the tech platforms, but also a decrease in advertising because of coronavirus restrictions, I think that you said are put on by the government. Um, how is your newspaper as the newspaper of record grappling with this? And what do you see happening in the media industry in Brazil during this moment? And do you think that, you know, you're going to have to rethink how journalism is done and what journalism means in this day and age? Um, I think, as you said, Courtney, uh, the business model of newspapers and, and even TVs was uh, really uh, being uh, threatened somehow. I mean, uh, very few media outlets have figured out how to be profitable uh, with internet, right? I mean, let's say the New York Times, the Financial Times, it, it's not easy. So when we have the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, revenues from advertising uh, shrink even more. And at the same time, the government, the federal government, uh, the president himself, he cut all government advertising. And on top of all, he's pressuring private ad advertisers, both in public, like on his Twitter account, and uh, in private, speaking to big businessmen, saying, you know, you have to stop uh, spending money advertising in the newspapers or TVs that are not patriotic. Patriotic is the word. So that does, uh, uh, it does affect a lot uh, the main newspapers, including my, the newspaper I work for. Um, and, and it's sort of ironic and sad because at the same time, I think people realize during the pandemic that when you're dealing with an issue so serious that can mean life or death, you need to trust professional journalists. I mean, we saw the credibility of uh, professional media outlets uh, rising, you know, people trusting more the news because, you know, you're not going to have a blogger or an influencer or, you know, some partisan person going to the hospitals or going to the favelas, the poor communities to see how people are, you know, dealing because they can't go out to work. So I think at the same time in this moment when we get um, more credibility and, and we have to uh, you know take this opportunity to improve what we're doing, um, it's the moment where economic, I mean financially it's it's really, really hard. Here in Brazil, uh, we had the pay cuts for, for all journalists, almost all journalists, uh, you know, in order to avoid layoffs uh, and in other professions as well. But I mean, everybody is, is trying to, to survive. Um, I, I hope next year gets better. Uh, I'm not sure because all these government programs, you know, they're not going to be there anymore. This uh, emergency um, grants that they're giving to people. So uh, not very optimistic, though. Do you think that um, 
journalism needs to kind of double down on the basics or it needs to come up with a new way of doing things. Because again, how do you, you know, how do you cover, uh, you know, a, a political event or a, a politician who is constantly um, saying untrue things, what, you know, lying or um, amplifying inaccurate information. And, you know, just related to that, we hear a lot about fact checking and, you know, these partnerships that the tech companies have created with fact checkers. I mean, aren't the original fact checkers journalists? And do we, do we, should we see those as different things? Those are excellent questions. Um, in terms of fact checking, um, I think the, the main challenge is to make accurate information or fact checking go viral. We haven't figured out how to do that, right? I mean, fact checking or uh, just uh, the news, a piece of uh, an article in a newspaper, it's usually very moderate or even boring because that's checked information. You're, you know, getting all sides and you're checking the, from original sources. Uh, whereas this information or fake news is so much more exciting, right? You get either outraged or so that goes into the algorithm of the internet platforms that they amplify it and also uh, about people people it's so much more interesting to read you know the pope supports president trump or candidate trump you know it's much more um which is fake news um so um this is one thing we're trying and then people say oh we should be doing different things you know like videos and and audio and i think yes that's part of the equation but at the same time um we're doing it's it's public interest, right? We're not going to be that exciting. Uh, I mean, it's it's just uh, it, it's a different business model, right? It's not entertainment, so it's something we're we're trying to figure out how to make accurate information or fact checking go viral, and at the same time, we cannot abandon the principles that make journalism journalism and not entertainment, right? I mean, we're not going to sacrifice those just to get amplified on, on social media, um, and then. Um, the other question, oh, the other question is, yes, I think just like in the US, we were being, um, we are being instrumentalized and, and used by politicians who know how to manipulate the news cycle, right? I mean, they just, I, I remember this year, we had very um, uh, disappointing uh, news about the GDP figures that were being uh, published, right? And in, in that same day, the president and, and his main uh, supporters, influencers, started spreading something about a famous doctor here that did a show on TV and that he had interviewed this uh, transgender woman that had committed a crime. I mean, it was absolutely not relevant. And they just spread this in the same day that we had uh, disappointing GDP news. And then all the media goes after the unimportant and unre not relevant news. So this is something we're trying to learn, you know, not to just be instrumentalized and we get used as a loudspeaker for, uh, you know, just not relevant uh, information. Uh, and on the other hand, we can't just ignore uh, what they say because that's how they govern. They govern through Twitter to Facebook. Sometimes they're, you know, enacting legislation or we can understand their strategy, political strategy. So it's, it's really trying to find a balance as not being used just to amplify those fake messages or, or biased information and not ignoring because we can't simply ignore, they use it to, to govern. Right. I mean, I think that's a, I think that's a, a great, you know, debate is whether, you know, the tweet of a president is inherently newsworthy or not. And, you know, who is going to make that decision and what the ramifications of that are going to be. I want to, I want to bring in a question from Barbara Chatterjee, um, who was asking to what extent does um, kind of the repetition of historical material, or maybe what she means like the context in a given story, you know, about that topic, taking up space in a story at the expense of maybe being able to put in more fact checking. So, you know, we're talking about, I would assume here, print stories or, or you know, video clips, you have 800 words or you have, you know, 60 seconds. How much of that time is being taken up by context? Do we need to think about rebalancing, again, kind of the, what goes into a journalistic piece to do that? 
It's a great question. Um, I think, yes, you're right. Maybe we should be giving more space to fact checking. And again, I mean, right away, it has to be in the first sentence, in the lead or on TV, the first thing you say, because otherwise this is going to go viral or be spread and people are not going to read instead of contextualizing that much. Although, I mean, in print journalism, I think we should still have this luxury of you know, contextualizing. I think it's important. It's, it's part of the difference of uh, journalism and just uh, social media, right? I mean, you do give the context, but maybe, yes, we should be uh, prioritizing um, fact-checking uh, and, and, and more and really calling a lie a lie, which is something we're not doing yet, I think, at least not in Brazil. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, just if I may share a personal experience, I used to work for the New York Times. And I remember um, I decided to leave to go pursue a PhD because I felt like in this in the journalistic form, we didn't have enough space to give context that we had to choose only one or two paragraphs of whatever that background was. I think I was working on some stories with David Sanger about like the AQ Khan nuclear network and, you know, these really critical stories in Abu Ghraib and you can pick, you know, a couple of pieces of context and that just seemed like insufficient. So I decided to go the whole other direction. Um, but I, I also want to ask you because we talked about the influence that Trump has had over Bolsonaro, but there's also um, Zainab Tufetchi made the argument um, that Bolsonaro and Modi and some of the other um, populist leaders around the world are better politicians um, than President Trump in terms of using the you know, reins of politics in that process to kind of stay in power. Um, we ha are having a political transition here in the United States. We'll have a new president in January. To what extent, if any, do you think that that is going to impact on the dynamics in Brazil um, and more broadly kind of around the world in terms of what we see, you know, from the fake news and disinformation mantra and, and just more broadly on the press freedom dimension? But we definitely want to hear what you're saying, so you'll have to oh, see yourself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a classic. You're a mute. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, no, the one thing I, I wanted to add is that we just had municipal election, local elections. And also, it, it's just bizarre how uh, the government, I mean, the main uh, the government supporters and the president himself, they had this huge uh, campaign against. Um, we have here electronic voting. So they were saying, you know, uh, the, um, there was fraud, widely spread fraud. I mean, it's exactly the same thing as we saw in the presidential elections in the US was here. They just uh, said the same thing. And we know they're just laying the ground for our presidential elections. They're also gonna question the results if they're not positive. So this is something that unfortunately we are uh, importing, I think. Um, and, and I do think it makes a huge difference um, if there's a different leader um, in the US. Because right now, um, our foreign minister said recently uh, something along the lines, we're very proud to be uh, uh, isolated in the world or a, a pariah, you say a pariah? A pariah in the world because we are with the United States. Right. I mean, it's one thing when you have this unpopular or racist or uh, homophobic positions and you have the strongest country on earth, the superpower, the U.S. supporting you. Whereas uh, starting next year, we won't have this. We won't have the support. We're going to be, you know, alone in this really uh, horrible positions with no support from the U.S., from the superpower. So. Um, Maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I, I think this is going to change things. I think this is, is going to help because right now, I mean, what does it help if you have Europe and other countries saying, you know, you have to change your environmental policy because the Amazon is burning. And then they say, well, you know, President Trump doesn't care and he supports us. So why would we change our behavior? Right. Whereas if you don't have a superpower supporting you, you kind of are not in a comfortable position anymore. Um, we have a question from another audience member, Mary Charlotte Domandi, 
who was wondering whether Brazilians are becoming more media savvy and skeptical because of Bolsonaro um, with COVID. Do you think that, you know, we've seen obviously an evolution, we've seen reporting on some of the, you know, issues at, at, as you've outlined here in terms of the inaccurate information. Are, are Brazilians becoming more media savvy? Are they becoming less media savvy? Is it the same? Um, I don't have any, um, I mean, research showing this, that people are or are not becoming more media savvy. I would say not, because if this recent uh, report that I wrote about that shows that Brazil is the only country in the world where uh, there's still a, a high circulation of fake news related to hydroxychloroquine and all these other medications for COVID-19. So I am not sure if people are getting more skeptical because they are getting used to Bolsonaro's style. I think, no, I think we, we still live in the bubble system that if you're in, in the bubble of his, you know, hardcore supporters, uh, he can say anything and they're going to believe it. So um, maybe, maybe the rest of the population, people who are not, you know, hardcore supporters, are getting a bit more skeptic, but I, I don't have any scientific data backing this. It would be more wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of this, how do you go about reporting on these types of dynamics related to, you said a couple of times that Brazil is the highest um, proportion of people who are looking, you know, who are still sharing this, this fake um, COVID-19 cure, hydroxychloroquine. How do you go about reporting on some of these issues, um, you know, especially when they relate to tech platforms and politicians who are, you know, not very interested in sharing their data or information? Talk to us a little bit about, about your process. Um, well, we have, uh, like the U.S., we have a Freedom of Information Act, that is usually very helpful in terms of understanding, uh, for instance, where the governor is putting advertising money, right? Because one of the things that change is that they are putting a lot of advertising money on uh, disinformation uh, websites and, and you know, uh, uh, pro-government websites and YouTube channels. YouTube is a huge uh, channel for disinformation uh, dissemination here in Brazil. So one of the things is to use more and more uh, freedom of information uh, requests. So you have to get whatever official data we have, for instance, uh, uh, concerning elections, uh, you have to report all your spending to the electoral court, so we do a lot of this. And we partner a lot with uh, universities uh, and uh, uh, digital forensics labs to sort of understand the dynamics, right? They have some tools like AI tools that usually journalists don't have. So we do a lot of partnering with them, you know, either uh, with reports or actually, you know, discussing. So can we uh, investigate this thing or that thing, you know, really partnering with, with, with them. Uh, for instance, when uh, Facebook uh, banned several accounts linked to uh, aids to um, Bolsonarista legislators and to pro uh, President Bolsonaro himself, uh, it was a, a digital forensics lab, the Atlantic Council one, uh, and the journalists. And we all together got together to, you know, get the news uh, out. So I think these these two things uh, are important. And, and do you think that this kind of collaborative model is the new model for a new form of journalism? I was reading about Comprova, which was a, I think, journalists from 24 different news outlets who collaborated to expose um, and fact check a bunch of fake news. And um, it, it's, it's similar to you know the Panama Papers or the, the Paradise Papers, these big collaborative projects. You're talking about working with think tanks and universities. You know, usually we think about journalists running to be first and the competition to break news first. But it seems like we're seeing a shift towards a collaborative model. Is that maybe part of the answer to 21st century journalism? I think it should be. I'm not sure if that's already happening in, in such a large scale in, in Brazil. 
uh, I mean, there are some international um, uh, projects that people are, get together. We had, you know, Panama Papers and other investigations, but I think there's still uh, a lot of competition between uh, among uh, media outlets. I'm not sure if that's really bad because on the one hand that makes you more, you know, eager and, and to go fast and, and very excited about your reporting. But I do think that sometimes, uh, I mean, facing what we're facing now, we're facing, you know, governments that are creating alternative realities. Uh, so it, it's sort of, you know, we're not just competing to get a scoop. We're just trying to all get together and put out facts, like actual facts out there. So maybe we should be doing this more than we are actually doing right now, I think. Well, in that um, effort to get out the facts, which as you rightly point out is kind of the core purpose of journaliz journalism, um, is we have a question from an audience member, Sydney Pope, you know, burnout. Is this an issue that journalists are facing this these days? And how do you, you know, as a journalist who is under, you know, pretty constant attack and, and getting threats all the time. And, you know, you open your book by talking about how your son, you know, came across some of these images of you online. Um, how, what helps you overcome all the attacks and the lies that you face on a regular basis? Um, well, I'm going to say it's tough. <laughs> it's a, that's sort of an understatement. I mean, it, it's, it really, um, uh, it's really bad when you're trying to do your work. I'll give you two examples. Like uh, the other day I interviewed uh, the US ambassador in Brazil about the 5G uh, uh, auction. This is a huge issue here, you know, China, US competition, blah, blah, blah. And then the ambassador shared the story I had written. And then you had all these trolls or people or bots saying, like this horrible things, you know, saying, oh, you, you shouldn't speak to this whore or you shouldn't, it's like horrible, right? Or when we women, other women are writing about, you know, going to the hospitals and spending, uh, you know, time inside an ICU in a public hospital, and then we have to stay in isolation away from our families. And then you're just putting your work out there and people are saying, you know, you're fat or you're offering. So it's, it's very hard. Right. This this is not what we learned in university or, or at school. I mean, what what do you do as a journalist? You just try to check the information, interview people, show empathy, uh, you know, check your grammar. But you don't you don't have to worry about people calling you these horrible things on the internet or, or sending you messages saying you should be raped. Um, so when it got really bad the the beginning of the year, of course I I. I had to seek psychological help, and I think many other journalists uh, had to do this. And I know um, some media outlets, they stopped sending women uh, to cover uh, some government officials because the, the environment got so misogynistic that it, it's really, uh, you know, toxic. So um, I, I'm not sure. I think we're all, I mean, when possible, we seek, uh, you know, psychological help. And then um, there's not much we can do because this is not going away, right? I mean, either we give up or they're not gonna stop doing this. They want us to give up. Well, I can say from, um, you know, the Committee to Protect Journalists perspective, you know, this is something we're seeing more and more of, you know, we have really seen the, the, the online harassment and the trauma. I mean, we, we call it online harassment, but it incorporates a whole host of horrible things, including, you know, many of the things you've alluded to, as well as sharing, you know, personal information of where the person lives, where the, you know, journalist works and, and, you know, where their children go to school and things like that. Um, these, you know, this has become a much bigger issue for journalists and basically endemic to the practice of journalism, especially if you're a woman journalist, especially if you are a journalist of color or any sort of intersectional identity. Um, and I, you know, I'm I, I feel concerned when I hear that, you know, women journalists aren't being sent to cover certain politicians or certain beats because that's almost like we're going backwards, right? So, 
you know, we want to be careful about that. But I do want to, you know, as we wrap up, mention if there's anyone out there who is a journalist or knows a journalist, you know, we have a lot of resources on our site, cpj.org, under Get Help, where you can get some tools to help you figure out what you at least can do to protect yourself um, from online harassment, as well as psychosocial resources where you can go to get um, that sort of support. Because I think that, you know, as you said, being open to talking about the mental um, toll that this takes is really important and knowing that there is a community in solidarity with you and supporting you. Um, I hope that that is helping you uh, get through your job. So before we wrap up, is there anything um, you want to leave the audience with, Patricia, before we wrap up this event? Um, yes, I think, well, that something that you mentioned, the solidarity is is really what makes us go on, I think. Uh, CPJ and other uh, women journalists and women, just women, I mean, here in Brazil, uh, the it is very hard. I mean, we we didn't realize we were such a misogynistic and, and, and racist country. Uh, I mean, we, we always were, but it wasn't so just open uh, before. People were not embarrassed to show this. But at the same time, there's uh, solidarity. Uh, you know, people just really helping uh, either organizations, Brazilian organizations or the CPJ and also other women. Uh, so, so this really is, is wonderful and, and, and this is so nice that people are. And also like for other women journalists, um, I still think it's the best job in the world. I mean, it's, it's so wonderful that, you know, even if we have to uh, uh, do stuff that's gonna make governments mad and they might really be aggressive, it's still worth it and, and we should keep doing this. With that hopeful and positive note, I want to thank everyone. Um, thank you, Sandy, for bringing us together, giving me the opportunity again to chat with Patricia, who is truly one of my um, journal journalism heroes and icons. And I'm just in great admiration of the work that you do. And I can't wait for you to find an English language publisher um, for your book. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Back to you. Thank you both so much. That was fantastic. As someone just wrote to to, uh, to the panelists, you know, we're we're thrilled we've been able to bring your story to uh, to this audience, and you are an amazing profile of courage and relentlessness, and and we wish you all the best in your reporting, and of course, Courtney to you too, and all the incredible work that you do. You are a dynamic duo. So thank you so much. Please come and join us in Santa Fe. We'll we'll send the invite out in a year or so, and we'd love to have you here in person. Just before we go, I'm going to um, put on screen a student speech. We like to always feature our high school fellows at Journalism Under Fire and at our gala and other things. Uh, and tonight we're going to hear from a young student uh, sharing some of her experiences in terms of understanding and relating to this crazy time of coronavirus and how hard it is for all of us, but how hard it is in particular for students um, you know, and, and, and younger, uh, you know, my kids are 10 and 12 and this is a tough time for them too. So we're going to feature her here. And, uh, uh, she is the daughter, let me point out of a teacher at, uh, Monte del Sol. Hello, Giselle. Uh, and we're thrilled to feature her right now. So here we go. Freshman year of high school, days downtown, late nights with friends, singing, dancing, carpools, laughing backstage during the opening night of theater and splashing into lakes, sharing food and walking to class shoulder to shoulder, seeing new faces and group hugs at the end of each day. None of us knew we were living today's favorite memories. Last year, as everyone at school said their goodbyes on the last day before spring break, nobody realized we wouldn't be coming back for much longer than two weeks. During the last quarter of my freshman year, I was spending what felt like my entire life in front of my Chromebook, hours of homework stacking on top of the virtual school day. I wasn't getting sleep and I was constantly stressed. It seemed like I had nothing to look forward to and in addition to not having seen my friends in months, I wasn't keeping in touch with anyone either. 
On top of that, I had gotten an Instagram account at the beginning of the summer, which, coincidentally, was the precise week the murder of George Floyd reignited the Black Lives Matter movement on social media. This new access to social media opened my eyes to some of the horrors of our country. Of course, I had learned about racism and the lack of gender equality in America, but I had never truly witnessed it, which is something that came with my Instagram account. I started taking the time to educate myself about the political divide of our country, but I wasn't focusing on how any of the constant cacophony of disheartening news was making me feel. This is when I decided it was time to make a change. I developed a healthier sleep schedule and began to direct my energy on my home. And instead of letting the information on Instagram make me feel hopeless, I decided to commit making it a part of my time on the app to spread awareness. I started posting about Black Lives Matter, women's rights, and children and animal and environmental justice. I started to feel like I was making a difference, even if it was subtle and like I had a purpose again. COVID-19 has changed my world forever, and I will never forget its lessons for the rest of my life. It has turned our lives upside down, and I know I am not the only one who has felt the weight of the world. But I think it's important to remember that every situation has a silver lining. COVID has taught me never to take what I have for granted. It's taught me to appreciate the now and to live in the moment, because you never know when your world might change forever. And most importantly, it has taught me that no matter how low I feel, no matter how hopeless a situation I may find myself in, there is always something to be grateful for. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Ami. Well. That ends tonight's program. We look forward to seeing you all tomorrow when, uh, of course, we'll feature Bob Woodward and others. That's at 5 p.m. Mountain. Meanwhile, have yourself a great evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.